I'm going to start because we have so much to show you tonight. We have to start relatively close to on time. There's still a few people coming in, uh, and there are seats available, so I hope you'll find them. Welcome to this chance to think about how we visualize the world, or to think also about how we might differently visualize the world. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor of the Arts and Design here at Berkeley, and it is a privilege to welcome you to the continuation of our Monday night lecture series on public reassembly. <clears throat> As you came in, some of you hopefully received a smaller card that represents uh, information about this series which was conceived in order to allow colleges, departments, schools, centers, museums, and presenting organizations from across the campus contribute to one vital routine lecture series every Monday night featuring the ideas and people that most compel the Berkeley faculty and our students. So tonight, we're gathering again. Some of you, this might be our, your first time on, at a Monday night event, Others are our regulars. I'll remind you that this theme of public reassembly that undergirds everything we're doing every Monday night was one generated in conversation with many faculty, many staff and students and community members in order to try to think about the political issues of assembly, the artistic issues, the educational issues, and the technological issues of assembly and of reassembling ourselves in a globalizing age. Tonight, we get to feature a campus organization that is a vital player in this conversation about the nature of assembly, the Graduate School of Journalism, our J School. Yeah, since, since its founding, many here don't need to be reminded, during the watershed moment of Berkeley's free speech movement, the J School has graduated more than 2,000 students. Its faculty and alumni have received virtually every industry award and now run or guide nearly every important news organization across the country. We're gonna get to see some of their incredibly compelling and transformational work tonight. The J School, of course, is a key element in our ongoing conversations in the Arts and Design Initiative about public reassembly, in part because of the possibilities and perils that we address right now as we face the impact of new technological platforms that have altered, of course, the very nature of journalism and, frankly, the very nature of public dialogue, whether it's still possible. The J School is also a place that continually reminds us that whatever the future holds, Truth matters, independence matters, ethics matters, and journalism matters. So I hope you'll help me welcome the intrepid dean of the J School who will introduce this program and tell us why it all matters. Dean Ed Wasserman. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Uh, I can't recall ever having been accused of being intrepid, but I'm, I like the sound of it. I thought that's what they said about reporters. Ah, and with reporters it's deserved. Um, let me ask you if you have these, just turn them off please. Um, Shannon, thank you for that introduction, uh, and thank you for piloting this series that, uh, on, 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 and for raising the curtain on the innovative work in art and design that's happening at UC Berkeley. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks also to Bamfa for making this lustrous venue available uh, to us. And, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we're used to having, getting three to 4,000 RSVPs and ending up with a couple dozen people depending on the sizes of immediate family. And this is wonderful. And I think you will be delighted and thrilled by the work you're going to see. Um, the, the series theme of assembly is one that we certainly recognize and embrace at the School of Journalism. Uh, in the digital age, as journalism educators, uh, we face a continuing challenge 
of adapting, harnessing, and applying new technologies for a very old purpose to meet the enduring civic need for illumination and accountability in public life. News media don't just deliver messages. They create and recreate the public sphere by drawing people into fresh assemblies as readers, listeners, and watchers who no longer passively consume, but they actively engage with the media and each other to create content and even to fashion channels of their own making. Tonight, we bring together some of Berkeley Journalism's outstanding visual arts faculty to show you what we're doing in the sweeping reinvention of journalism that's going on now. In a few moments, presenters Kochi Hernandez, who teaches new media, Ken Light, who directs a photography program, and Monica Lamb, who teaches video, will come up here to present work that we think exemplifies the directions in which our students are taking journalism. But first, a few introductory remarks about the Graduate School of Journalism itself, which marks its 50th anniversary this year. The core of our school is an artisanal two-year master's program. We graduate some 55 to 60 students a year. They are focused exclusively on careers as professional journalists. Berkeley journalism has long punched above our weight class. We produce barely a quarter of the graduates each year that our cross-country rival Columbia turns out. But our grads, though few, flourish in the world's very best news organizations, from the New York Times to 60 Minutes to NPR. We're delighted to read their work everywhere, from the New Yorker and the Atlantic to Pacific Standard, Wired, Mother Jones, and The Guardian. And increasingly, thanks to the explosion of bandwidth that accommodates ever more inventive approaches to storytelling, our graduates leave bristling with new media skills as well. They make podcasts, films and videos, they learn to code, they make cross-media projects that take advantage of the latest in data analysis and display. The result is graduates who are both traditional, dogged, seekers of fact, and leaders in pioneering visual production and presentation, painted with an ever richer expressive palette. So that's the core of the school, but we do more. We launched a summertime minor in journalism to expose Berkeley undergraduates to the full range of cross-platform communicative skills they'll need to be media literate, no matter what line of work they pursue, whether they're lawyers or diplomats or physicians. Through our Berkeley Advanced Media Institute, we train mid-career professionals from newsrooms and, and other organizations across the country and actually across the world. Our photo gallery, created through a gift from the Reeve and David Logan Foundation, exhibits top photojournalism year-round. And our audio program now produces a regular podcast of interviews with notable speakers called On Mic. Our investigative reporting program turns out cutting-edge work that airs on the PBS NewsHour, Frontline, and elsewhere. And now they're producing content for Amazon. We live stream events and hold prestigious in-person conferences in narrative writing and investigative reporting. And we bring top speakers to campus to analyze contemporary media topics, as, such as press freedom, fake news, and the Me Too movement. This evening, you'll be treated to work by recent alums and current students, which includes photography and new media projects involving drone footage, animation, and 360 video. You'll also see two recent student Oscar winning short documentaries. We're very proud of this work. Delighted that you've joined us tonight for this look at the future of visual journalism. So now it's my pleasure to introduce a long clip from an exceptional film, 4.1 Miles, produced by Daphne Matsiaraki, class of 2016. Daphne's film premiered at Telluride. It won the student Oscar. It was selected as a New York Times op doc and was a finalist for the Academy Awards. It's a sub the subject is something that took her back to her native Greece where she chronicled the attempt by people leaving the Middle East to cross the four-mile strait that separated Turkey from the island of Lesbos and thereby access to the European Union. It's a, it's a moving and thrilling film, and I'm very, very proud to present it to you tonight. Thank you. Στα μάτι τους βλέπω ότι ακόμα υπάρχουν εικόνες από τον πόλεμο τον οποίο ζούμε. 
έρχονται από τον πόλεμο, γλιτώνουν από τις βόμβες που πέφτουν στα σπίτια τους και βλέπουμε οι οικογένειες να, να χάνουν τους ανθρώπους τους μέσα στην, στα ελληνικά ύδατα, τα ειρηνικά ελληνικά ύδατα, λόγω της θάλασσας που διασχίζουν. Ο Κυριάκος είμαι. Ετοιμάστε το σκάβος, βγαίνουμε άμεσα. Γρήγορα, εντάξει. Ετοιμάστε το για απόπλο. Έλα, για να ένα στίγμα. Δώσε 
over soon. I encourage you to seek out that truly exceptional film by a truly uh, exceptional um, filmmaker. Um, indeed, it can be viewed in its entirety um, online. Um, I want to uh, start by uh, introducing the next section um, with a two-minute trailer that encompasses uh, the work of uh, a dozen re recent students who produced uh, packages in multimedia. So unlike our dean who asked you to put your phones away, um, I, on the other hand, should be encouraging you to take your phones out um, and to experience stories on them, um, to pull out your VR headsets and put them on and experience the world in a different way. Um, and when I was asked to stand up here, I, I, I thought about this wonderful Martin Mole quote that said, writing about music is like dancing about architecture, and today talking about interactive narratives is much like dancing about architecture. Um, but one of the things that's certainly on point here when we talk about the new media program at UC Berkeley um, Graduate School of Journalism and the wonderful work that the students are doing, which, which you will get to experience in a theater, which is where it's not at all um, meant to be experienced, but we'll do our best. But one of the, the, the most pressing questions um, to the students in new media is, is something that was brought up at the beginning, is how we take these traditional forms of media created for platforms that we've known and that have existed and put them on this um, platform. To me, although the internet is in its 20s, its mentality is that of a 12-year-old. Um, and how do we reassemble our media so that we can present stories on a platform that has its own new characteristics, some of which we haven't fully explored. So how do we take film and data viz and text and audio um, and bring them together? So we're gonna give you a sampling, I'm gonna give you a sampling of what our students have 
done. And not only um, is it about the internet in general, but increasingly um, their thinking and our focus as we teach them is about the, the mobile story, the mobile web, because the billions of people who are not yet on the internet um, will come in a mobile door, not a desktop door. And what we and every student here who, who, pr who produce these packages thought about is, and I think a, a, a question for all storytellers of the age is to continually ask yourself, what can a story be right now? What is the potential that the platform, the internet offers us for us to reassemble and take stories and present them? Um, I think it's critical that we ask ourselves this question. Um, I think we, if we are going to continue um, journalism and its continued relevance, we need to have an answer um, to how stories should be presented online. So this is our answer, and the first one comes in the form of uh, a story that starts out like most uh, stories at the J School. Uh, somebody is in a pitch meeting and says, oh my gosh, you know, my friend just got their cell phone stolen. Um, they had their window open and somebody reached out and grabbed it. And we said, investigate that. And they go to the police and the police give them a surprising fact like, wow, did you know that cell phone rise is, is actually up? And we have one of the very first uh, divisions in the nation that has a cell phone crime unit. And then they did a story on that. And then they realized the impact not only in um, a local sense, but the larger impact uh, that the black market of cell phones uh, has globally, and it starts on a human scale. Um, and you'll see examples of their attempt to explain the concept using animation. Um, we'll show a trailer, and then we'll show how they humanized it, and we'll also begin to look at the website or the uh, mobile web experience on the big screen. So we'll start with their uh, with their intro video. There are now more cell phones in the world than humans. Globally, one out of four people owns a smartphone, and that number is expected to double in just five years. We use our phones to communicate with loved ones, store photos, find and share information, organize our days. They have become an indispensable part of our lives. But with this convenience comes a danger. One in ten smartphone owners in the States has had their phone stolen. Some have even lost their lives. In most major U.S. cities, at least half of all robberies involves the theft of a cell phone. That means a phone is stolen roughly every ten seconds. Cell phones have become so valuable that an entire underground economy has sprung up around them. It's a world hidden from sight where stolen phones are trafficked across borders like drugs and sent to the far corners of the globe. refurbished and repackaged could wind up in the pocket of a teenager in Hong Kong or a tourist in Rio de Janeiro. From a street thief to a trafficker to the overseas businesses that peddle smuggled phones to unsuspecting customers. Follow the trail of a stolen cell phone. experience of creation is taking an audio native, uh, if you will, student and pairing them with a videographer and then pairing them with an investigative reporter and taking these different mindsets and approaches and bringing them together to create something um, that is meant to be experienced on your phone or on your laptop um, and using the best um, versions of uh, the media that are um, best applied to the particular part of the story. So they're actually weaving together um, videos, photos, audio, 
And now uh, you can see this is uh, the run of the website, which has a real life counter of how many cell phones are stolen um, the entire time you're on the site. So it's not only mixing together um, data visualizations, video at the appropriate time, right? So unfolding the story um, as a whole, right, with a lot of attention paid to detail, design, and when the most appropriate use of a medium is. Um, and not to mention, not to get lost in all of this, there's also um, a responsibility um, by, uh, from our journalists to explain as best they can uh, how some of these complicated things are working. So one of the new aspects of the curriculum is uh, something that I call animating the news. It's about bringing motion graphics um, into journalism and into these experiences. And you'll see that in a next part, uh, the next part of their uh, website, which was a uh, small uh, two-minute explainer. Phones stolen in the United States have ended up on every continent except Antarctica. They pass through a lot of different hands to get there. Here's a common scenario. It usually starts with a simple street robbery. In most major U.S. cities, at least half of robberies involve the theft of a cell phone. The thief tries to turn it into cash as quickly as possible, sometimes in minutes. The thief seeks out a buyer or fence who pays cash for phones on the street. Once they have a bag full of phones, they take it to a seemingly legitimate cell phone repair shop that pays cash for used phones, no questions asked. These businesses have international connections. Here at the shop, phones stolen on the street are packaged up with other phones obtained illegally through contract fraud and identity theft. Bundled together, they are shipped abroad, most often to Hong Kong or Dubai. Because of their small size, phones can be sent via standard delivery packages, placed in luggage, or even taped to people's bodies. In some cases, the phones are packed into shipping containers, often with other stolen goods. No one knows exactly how many phones are leaving the country each year. But in 2012, just one business got busted after sending almost 400,000 stolen phones abroad, mostly to China. After these phones leave the US, they are wiped, flashed, and re-kitted with manuals and accessories so they look and function like new. Some sophisticated criminals have machines that can crack even the most secure phones. The phones are then smuggled all over the world, where they are often sold as new, on the street, in stores, online, virtually anywhere there's a black market. Many buyers hunting for discount smartphones never suspect they may be purchasing something stolen. And uh, finally, um, to finish this uh, particular project, an uh, excerpt um, from a uh, family story in uh, Chicago whose um, daughter was uh, killed for her cell phone. Your sister's at the hospital, so we're gonna take you there. And I said, okay. And I'm like, what happened? And they were like, well, there was a shooting. So I got there and they brought me into a room with the doctors who had tried to save her life. And they told me that she had died. Um, I, I remember it coming out of Annie's mouth yes. that Megan, Megan was shot and Megan's dead. She just, Annie just told me that over the phone. She's dead. I mean, that's it. That's it. I just, I just remember screaming. I knew right away it was her cell phone. Megan was shot. Megan's dead. They killed her for her cell phone. I just was hysterical. Again, so, um, uh, moving on to 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 the next project again. Um, I, I think it bears uh, repeating that the best way the, uh, to experience these, and at the end we'll, we'll give you a link, um, is at, 
is as the students um, intended them um, to be um, experienced um, online or, or, or on a mobile device. Um, the next piece, um, the evolution of, of energy is significant because it represents um, a, a, a sea change in the technical side of things in terms of how things are produced. 95% um, of this project that you will see from um, video to photos um, was all produced um, on an iPhone. So taking um, quite an interesting, uh, they traveled all around the world um, and, and relied um, on a small device, which is something that we try and instill in students that the story itself um, and the content is most important. And secondarily, tools have become so good that you don't have to worry about having the best tool in your hand uh, to get things done. And oftentimes, the best tool can be something like a mobile phone. I am in love with lithium <laughs> because uh, uh, I think it's the, the last opportunity for Bolivia to go out of the poverty. The competition is very, very stiff because battery or energy storage is so important. And, and, and while the, the trailers are, are meant to be a bit of a lean back experience, the experience of, of, of all of these sites and all of these projects um, that, I, that I'm showing you really are created for a lean forward experience for the audience member to have some agency in terms of choosing their path or choosing their stories. Um, and again, you can see um, by the example here the interweaving of all kinds of media and again, uh, uh, the, the reporting was spectacular. Uh, the story is a wonderful story. Uh, but again, um, speaks to the power of the tool at hand. The best reporting tool that you have with you is the one, uh, is the one you have with you, the one in your pocket oftentimes. Um, one of the most difficult things um, that we are beginning to face um, are uh, stories heard audibly that have a powerful, powerful message um, and yet don't have the visual evidence um, to support them. So how do we bring those stories to life? And increasingly, um, journalists are, are, are uh, grabbing uh, you know, their, their paint and brushes uh, and putting their skills um, in the service of story using um, animation and motion, motion graphics. And this is a small um, excerpt from a larger um, documentary film on the Blind Boys of Alabama, uh, a Grammy uh, award-winning um, musical group, and um, also um, would fit within the larger context of an online experience. In 1939, I was barely seven. A lady came to my mother and told her there was a school she knew about that accepted blind children. She said they would teach a trade, a vocation, like making brooms. She said they would teach you to read and write braille. She said I didn't have no choice but to go. I don't know how long they discussed it. Before I went up there, 
but I know that it was a Wednesday afternoon. This lady, Miss Johnson, I forgot her first name. My mother and I got in Miss Johnson's car and she drove us to the school. We walked straight to the principal's office and he said that he was glad we were there and that I couldn't go back home until Christmas because it was September. I left the principal's office. My mom, she told me goodbye and I thought the world had come to an end. Picture this, your mama taking you to a place, a state-funded school. You're not even seven years old. She's leaving you up there. You don't know nobody. You can't see nothing. And she just go on back home. I was up there all by myself. I didn't know what it was going to be like, but I knew my mama was gone. My second day, I got into a fight. They were testing me. <laughs> of course I won. It was supposed to be a blind school, but it was more like a reform school. They would lock you up at night. They wouldn't even feed you. It was rough. My mom said she started turning around to come and get me on that Wednesday afternoon. I wish she had. But as time went on, I was glad she didn't. We got this little quartet going, and that gave us a little incentive to want to stay up there. Back then, we had a guy by the name of John Stockdale. He was the supervisor at the time. In other words, he was the overseer of the blind boys in the school. And if you're the supervisor, you had the privilege to whip boys as you please. He had this weapon that he whipped us with. I don't know if you know what a plow line is. It's a rope. He would put the rope in the water and let it soak. And that would make it really hard and tough. And that's what he would whip you with. He loved it. He would create things to whip us for. I remember one time in the winter, he said, I want y'all to go out and find me a green leaf. If you don't find one, I'm going to tear you up. How you going to find a green leaf in the winter time? Johnny Fields told me he found one. Hmm, <laughs> nobody believed him. Johnny was the only one that didn't get no whipping. Maybe he did find one. That same year, I met Clarence Fountain and George Scott. We got together with Johnny Fields and started a quartet. The girls had a little quartet thing going on too. We weren't allowed to even associate with them at that time. We had a side, and they had a side. We were separated from them. I want to say segregated, but we were separated. We would sneak around and talk to them. But if we got caught, we would get a whipping. We could hear them, and they could hear us. And when they finished, we would clap. And when we finished, they would clap. We couldn't see each other. But we could hear each other sing. Lay your body down. Lord help you, boy. Um, another very interesting um, thing that the students grapple with is they come to New Media and they ask what the future of documentary film is. And Leslie Corey last year, um, again, all of these projects are. are, are uh, produced within the last year, um, produced a documentary film, 25-minute film on community p policing um, at the, in the police department in um, Stockton. She had unprecedented access. Um, and we came back and asked ourselves, how do we present this um, to an online audience? Um, and I'll scroll a little bit through the piece. Um, one of the things that, that, that the choices that she decided to make um, was to offer the 25-minute documentary for those that, that wanted to watch it online, but at the same time, write a very compelling written piece coupled with chunkifying, it's a word that we came up with, clearly isn't going to win any prizes, but chunkifying content in terms of how it should be dispersed. So as the prose unfolds, when we have visual evidence 
via the film, the video, the documentary, this is the right place for it. It isn't a, a willy-nilly kind of splattering of content all over the place. The structure and form of design and unfolding of an online project um, is very important um, to students. Um, and again, the idea of uh, uh, this being a reality uh, one day of, of maybe reaching under your seat and pulling out the, the the 360-degree uh, headset. The dream, of course, would be that we could be wearing a pair of glasses like myself and do a little swipe here on the corner and be in that world. And if you think that that is um, out of the question, I grew up in an era where Uhura wore uh, something in her ear and Kirk communicated over something that uh, resembles a cell phone now. So this may not be out of the question, but students still take it upon themselves um, and these three uh, certainly did, um, to take the platform of now, how can a story be told now, um, and experiment in the realm of virtual reality in 360, um, again, on a very, uh, in, in very important uh, topic. And what we learned was the level of empathy that it creates um, when you put someone in the shoes of someone else and they can stand there and experience in 360 degrees and move around and oftentimes with some tactile feedback depending on the system you're creating for. Um, the level of experience, the door that's open for um, journalism and um, our ability to tell stories. So um, they created little tiny worlds, if you will, of each of these asylum seekers um, and put you in classrooms with them, put you in lines with them, put you uh, where they were staying. And in this particular piece, again, um, not made for, uh, for this uh, particular platform here, um, and very hard to imagine. I find that people um, who don't quite understand uh, virtual reality in th 360 haven't actually tried it beyond a, a piece of cardboard, which is you know, um, certainly not the best viewing experience. But to be standing and hearing a character in your ear say, this is where I stood the very first time I entered Germany, and this is what I thought, and this is what I went through, as the 360 uh, video degree uh, unfolds is quite a powerful experience. Uh, again, that I'm asking you to, to um, hopefully experience on your own. Um, and again, taking the idea of, of how you create a package um, that doesn't ha that has a lot of sensitivity to it um, and um, basically how you work through the design um, is something that these students took on uh, with something called the Chinese closet, of, of which you will see um, some of the uh, 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 screens should go here to show you how using um, just down to the paper feel and how things unfolded and how data visualizations unfolded. Again, disseminating uh, information uh, in almost a more controlled way, right? Less, lots of text. Um, and um, uh, they also did some, um, some animations. Um, and to begin to wrap it up, um, one of the things that we're most proud of here is you take a student uh, like Brett M Murphy, who incubated um, uh, his project, his investigative project. Um, we teamed up for the first time with the investigative reporting program, and that, that synergy continues today, where they uh, helped him um, with some of the reporting, and then we brought the investigative reporting uh, together and um, built a news package around it, an interactive package. Uh, Brett went on to be uh, interviewed um, on C-SPAN about the package that went to be a uh, USA Today investigation that not only he had started uh, at Berkeley, but there was uh, cross-pollination uh, cross between um, projects, you can see there. And ending up here, uh, sometimes we have projects that are uh, put into this uh, platform, but definitely have a life outside the platform. And this really uh, wonderful and courageous story um, by these filmmakers um, was something that we were able to repackage and reassemble and bring to the Staying PBS in Asia, we found an organization that is helping young women in Afghanistan participate in new outdoor sports for that country, hiking and rock climbing. Independent filmmaker Atiya Musazeh brings us the story of Ascend Athletics, an American organization that's training what has become the first climbing team of its kind in the war-stricken country. 
So again, um, just to point out that one of the things we hope that you do, um, these are just some examples of, of other projects that are being um, produced to show you the range of uh, apps that are being created, rethinking the documentary, um, uh, even uh, things like um, uh, Muslim pop culture and what a site like that could be, and the Privilege Project bringing um, strangers together to talk about privilege is ju are just a, really a small sampling of projects that you can see. We, I really encourage you to go to newmedia.report, um, which is the site where you can find all of these interactives and experience uh, experiences and really experience them on the, the platform they were meant to experience. So um, on behalf of, uh, of the multimedia team at UC Berkeley and the students who have contributed um, uh, work here tonight, I just want to say thank you. Photography at the Graduate School of Journalism has many moving parts. Classes where we produce a photo book each fall semester, and in the spring, we produce Realize Magazine, which is in its 16th year of publication. Each semester, we have exhibitions of world-class photographers in our gallery, like Sebastio Salgado, Susan Macellis, Mark Rabu, Wayne Miller, and Jim Nockway. The photographers visit the school, and we host public lectures. Last year, we held our first photo book symposium with Gerhard Steidel as the guest speaker, seen on the bottom left. The photo on the top right um, is the advanced documentary photography class this semester visiting the San Francisco MoMA um, to view the work of Walker Evans. The bottom right is one of our students out on Telegraph Avenue shooting for a class ass assignment. I hope in the next 15 minutes to share with you some of the creative and delightful storytelling photographs that our J School students have created in the last year. This year in our photo book class, we created a book titled A Season, Photographs of the Cal Football Season. Our journalist photographers were credentialed to each Cal football game and wandered on the field and off to portray the 2017 Cal football season. We wanted to see football not from the plays on the field, but trying to photograph what is the circus that makes football the opiate of the masses. Our photographers were Samantha Clark, Pablo de la Hoya, Alexandria Fuller, Sonar Kehart, Khalid Said, Jared Stapp, Jeff Wessinger, Bradley Machado, Ashley Vu, and Rosa Freneau. And here are some of the book layouts and some of the photographs they made.
With our, with our photo program, we have hands-on editing experience in all the photo classes. Students actually print out the photos and we play with the selection. We edit and crop and sequence. This past year's Realize Magazine had a variety of stories and I wanted to uh, show two stories that the class chose as among the strongest. Um, the Realize cover um, uh, is a wonderful story that Rosa Furneaux spent the semester doing an in-depth reportage on uh, new recruits in the Oakland Fire Department. Her story, uh, Where There's Smoke, follows cadets as they struggle through their very rigorous training to final graduation as uh, firefighters. Uh, so successful was her story that The Guardian in England published her photos and then selected one of her photos as one of the top photos of take, taken in 2017 in its yearly news review. And, uh, and, as, and as Rosa has said, it was a lifetime dream of hers to be published in The Guardian, and it came true, and it was very well deserved. And these are some of uh, Rosa's photographs from her story. The back section of our magazine, the back section of our magazine um, is the second most coveted spot of, of our publication. Um, and this past year, uh, Brittany Hosea Small photographed drag kings, uh, women who transformed from one gender to another, and as she wrote, anything in between. She had amazing access and as well created a series of powerful studio portraits of before and after the transformation as well as also documenting their personal lives on stage and at home. And these are some of the pictures from her magazine story. Jared Stapp, a student in our news photography class, photographed San Francisco in a way that we don't often see, creating a colorful and vibrant look at the city as seen through his unique vision as a street photographer. Thank you, and um, uh, 
And, and do join us for the opening of our next photography show at the Reva and David Logan Gallery of Documentary Photography at our building at Northgate Hall, which is on March 16th at 6 o'clock for an exhibition of the work of Joseph Rodriguez called El Barrio, Photographs of Spanish Harlem in the 1980s. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to end this evening by letting you sit back and watch an entire film from beginning to end. My name is Monica Lamb. I'm class of 2004 uh, at the Graduate School of Journalism. Um, I produced many documentary films, worked in investigative reporting, and I currently work at KQED as the senior producer of a weekly news program called KQED Newsroom. The next film is called Hail, and the man behind the camera Brad Bailey, class of 2017, and the man in front of the camera, the main character of the film, Hale, are both here tonight. <laughs> the film won a Student Academy Award. And in addition to its many accolades, one of the things that brings this story home for me are the many beloved and perhaps not so beloved places, local places, that are featured in the film. Ladies and gentlemen, hail. <laughs> Hale Zoukas was born in 1943. Diagnosed early with cerebral palsy, he was educated in a one-room schoolhouse in San Luis Obispo, California. His mother refused to institutionalize him. When Hale was born and then there were all of the 
diagnoses of what was going to happen. And they were urging her early on to put him in an institution. And she said, oh, no. She said, I knew he was bright. She said he'd, he'd lie in his crib and he'd watch when I'd turn the lights on. He'd well, take his eyes from the switch to over where the light turned on. He, he was figuring things out, even, even as little as a baby. So I knew that, that he had a good brain. Hale was a student at UC Berkeley, a math major and fluent in Russian. The Berkeley Physically Disabled Students Program had been around for a few years, started by Ed Roberts. They were housed in a hospital off campus and the university could not meet the growing demands of the disabled community as a whole. Hale and four others founded the Center for Independent Living, the first group of its kind in the world dedicated by disabled people for disabled people. Everybody was so excited because this was going to be really independent living. And then, of course, they became so successful because they dealt with every aspect from how to get around in a motorized wheelchair to what's your sex life going to be like as a disabled person <laughs> and yes you can have one <laughs> and you know touching every topic of life actually the demonstration is going on throughout the entire nation washington new york denver here in san francisco in 1977 Protests erupted nationwide to expand disability rights throughout the nation. Rights that were promised and not delivered. Hale and other disability activists stormed the San Francisco Federal Building to protest the Jimmy Carter's administration's refusal to sign Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Section 504 was to prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability. One thing, it's the first really militant thing that disabled people have ever done. And we feel like we're building a real social movement. We're really sympathizing with the, with the, with the demonstrators. You know, they, they understood this was an issue. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of sex but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across the country is going to continue, it is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally maybe you begin to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to up oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. We want no more segregation. We will accept no more discussion of segregation. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Forty years after the protest, Judy Human sat down to talk about that fateful day. And nobody defined, for example, no curb cuts on streets as discrimination. No one defined a movie theater where they said you had to get out of your wheelchair as discrimination. No one defined a bus that wasn't accessible or a train that wasn't accessible as discrimination. And even if you lost, even if you applied for a job and clearly didn't get that job because of disability, it still wasn't being called discrimination. Hale, now a leader of the movement went with Judy Human and other activists to Washington to confront the Carter administration. They emerged victorious. As I believe that this, as in any movement for human liberation, you free one set of people and doors open for everybody. Ed, of course, and Judy could speak very fluently and they were the mouthpiece of the movement. But in so many ways, Hale was the workhorse, going to those commission meetings, making sure things got done. F-T, draft. Draft. So do you want me to look up draft here? Hale learned on his board. He feels comfortable, he's in charge. I think being in charge is very important. <coughs> Do you want to look at this one? I 
think Hale's great strengths are his intellect and his belief. And if he believes in something, he will fight for what he believes in. There's a lot of ways in which this is, is research that is innocent. I think the transformative part of Hale to me has been watching him and how he can get his point across. Uh, the motion is to approve publication of the 2015 edition of the standard. Okay, thanks. Okay, all in favor of uh, uh, publishing the 2015 edition of the standard, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Okay, the first. Uh, hey, are you voting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The motion carries. So he traveled every day on BART, so he really knew the BART system extremely well. And he knew what was needed to make it fully accessible. And because he worked uh, in an institute that was all disabilities, of course, he was very aware of the disability needs of other people uh, within the disability community. Even the design of the button, the, the design of the button that we have today is basically Hale's design. Uh, so if you go to any elevator in the system and look at the button, that is a button that Hale basically said, this is what we need. In 2012, Hale was honored for his work in transit with a plaque at the Ashby Rail Station in Berkeley. He continues his advocacy work to this day. Hale makes the monthly trip to attend the Transit Accessibility Board meeting in downtown Oakland. Here Hale is to come to that the BART Accessibility Task Force meeting. It starts at 2, but he's looking to be on time. And one of the elevators was down, and the impact that, that that had on him. He has to go to an adjacent station and then traverse back. He's a man of the people, and he goes with the, the public, and he takes public transit, and he makes a, a tremendous effort. So when when something isn't right, to when when something isn't accessible, and he, and he brings it up, um, it's a powerful message that, that he's sending. Now he's he's missed a good chunk of this meeting, where his input is so valuable. That's separate from that minimum basic accessible path. Sorry, buddy, you still got some brown hair. Uh, he doesn't accept no for an answer, and that has its good parts and its bad parts. Well, the good parts are that um, he makes his way in the world. You know, he, he doesn't accept limitations. And um, the bad part of not accepting limitations is that it gets you into trouble. It could be dangerous. and he's hurt himself a number of times, but somehow he keeps going.
Whitewater, for the Rose Law Firm, for Travelgate, for Floreshot Gate, for Gategate, for Westfield, for Livermore Outlets. She did. <laughs> Hale tells me he's depressed, but Hale is so optimistic, you wouldn't believe it. Hale will go forward and will push, and he won't get stopped. And that's not the sign of someone who's depressed. That's the sign of someone who, who really feels that, that he knows where he wants to go or knows what the issue is. Have you ever contemplated suicide? Yeah. I want you to be honest with me. Yeah. You have? Yeah. So what stopped you? <laughs> what stopped you? <clears throat> Being on the other side of the T H I N L I N B been on the other side of the thin line. I think that there's need for a lot more hails out there. And um, it's, it's like someone being an explorer. There's, there's, there's lots of uh, battles that need to be fought in order to make um, a quality, to help people attain a quality of life that we all want for ourselves and each other. You know? Hale really overcame the greatest barrier. He insisted on being heard. He insisted on speaking out. He insisted on getting it right. <laughs> and he made things happen that showed that it was possible for them to happen. And once uh, that occurs, a change is possible everywhere. You spent your whole life fighting for people to have better access and disability rights and to be able to, to live their own life independently. Why did you not quit? What was the reason you fought so hard? I did not want No. My S T Y L E End of word C R A M P Cramp
Well, um, let me acknowledge and salute Brad Bailey and Hale Zukas, who are here with us. By <laughs> Let me close by pointing out that events like this, just like the work that you've seen, uh, these don't produce themselves. Let me acknowledge the people who put this one together. Um, everyone who is behind this scenes at the J School, uh, Deirdre English, uh, Jeremy Rue, Marlena Telvik, Julie Hirano, Chris O'Day, Thank you for making this happen. Um, for the rest of you to support our work, uh, we certainly acknowledge and welcome whatever support and, and, uh, that you can provide. As the University of California pivots from being a public university to being a publicly assisted university, that leaves kind of a gap in resources, and so sometimes we pass the hat, and sometimes we simply remind you that the university's costs can only be shifted so much onto the students that we have to find other sources. That's why we rely on philanthropy. That's why we create revenue-producing areas. And so keep us in mind when you think about worthy causes out there. Um, I also want to ask that the students and graduates whose work was presented tonight, who were too numerous for me to name, uh, if you're here tonight, would you please stand and let us give you a round of applause you deserve? <laughs> and Daphne, are you here? There was a rumor that Daphne Matsuraki was going to be here, the person who made 4.1 miles. No, not true. All right. Um, I do urge you to see the entirety of that film. It is a powerful and moving piece of work. I'm sorry? Ah, and you can get it on the New York Times site if you go to the New York Times Op Docs. It's there. Um, so thanks to them, all of you who made this happen. Thanks to you for coming, and I wish you a, f a fabulous evening. Thank you. Thank you.